Um, I am a cannabis activist and social justice activist, and I am one of the owners of theweedblog.com, which is a cannabis news and information publication. Um, I am also a mother of three. I have three boys. They are 15, 13, and nine, and they keep me very busy um, alongside the work hats that I wear. Um, aside from my work hat at the Weed Blog, I also spend a fair amount of my time doing activism and advocacy, which is why I'm so excited to talk to you guys today about this topic because I think it's so, so important and um, love that Tokativity, you know, came up with the tagline of how to use your Canamom voice for consistent progress because that's what we're going to talk about today. Because it's about being consistent and looking at the big picture and really moving forward with it. So um, outside of the, the writing that I do and um, editorial work that I do with the Weed Blog and my freelance work, I'm also a member of the Advisory Council for Marijuana Matters, um, which is a social equity um, organization based in Washington, D.C., as well as an advisor for Mommies and Mary Jane. Um, who are also here at this awesome Tokativity Canna Moms event today. Their um, room is actually right when this one ends, so I'll be hopping over there at 410 when this is over. Um, but they're a fledgling nonprofit that is advocating for all things Mommies and Mary Jane. It's been incredible. And as I mentioned, I'm also a board member for the Canna Mommy nonprofit, and Tokativity also has their founder, Kelly Bruce, presenting a session right now, and she's incredible and just feels super lucky to be working alongside all these amazing women. Um, something I've been working on most recently here in Oregon is um, the Oregon Cannabis Equity PAC. I'm one of the founding members for the PAC, and we are currently lobbying for House Bill 3112 or the Oregon or Oregon Equity Investment Act through the Oregon legislature now. And we're actively lobbying for it and really hopeful it'll make it through because um, in my opinion and in the opinion of the work group leadership, it will create the most comprehensive cannabis social equity program in the country. So we're really, really excited about that. I know it was really amazing to listen to Tanya Osborne's um, New York legalization recap earlier in this event and everything that she had to say, um, just about everything they're going to have to continue to ag advocate for in there in New York, even with their big, um, you know, legislative announcement with legalization, you know, they're still working on expungement. She was talking about, you know, mothers and CPS and, you know, all those things. So it's just the advocacy is never ending. And I think New York definitely has, you know, potential to be in that amazing cannabis social equity bucket. Um, and so I'm hoping that what we're doing here in Oregon will be able to, um, you know, be an inspiration for them as they're working on their, their rules and regulations and as their laws rolling out. Um, so thank you everyone for joining me for uh, Confident Activism, How to Use Your Canamon Voice for Consistent Progress. Um, I actually gave a talk similar to this. It was a lightning talk at the Women Grow Summit in 2016, and it was called Going Grassroots. And it was all about grassroots activism. And it's honestly been one of my favorite things to talk with people about ever since then, not necessarily in a formal platform like this, but just in, in general. Um, so, I think like starting with this being a Canna Moms event and with, you know, what um, the content of this is around, I think one of the things we need to think about first is that like once you become a mom, you become an activist, whether you want to or not. You know, this was actually really echoes what um, G. Williams was just saying on the main stage. She was saying, you're a mom and that's the best thing that can happen to you, whether you're a dog mom or a cat mom or a plant mom or because you're going to fight for whoever you're mothering. So whoever you're momming, I like to call it, whoever it is you're momming, whether it's people or plants or a certain situation or you know a family unit or who, whomever it may be, you're gonna fight for whoever the, those person or those entities are. You have become an activist because you are a mom. Something, you know, if you weren't already, if you were fighting for yourself, it's in a different way because now you're fighting for someone else always, you know, once you have, you know, especially a human child is what I'm going to compare it to today because I have three of them and it just gave me a calling in life that I never really had before. And, you know, that term mama bear is there for a reason, right? We protect our people. We take care of, you know, the people that mean things to us. So becoming a mom makes you sort of an innate activist. Um, whether it is, you know, you advocating for things that have to do with school, advocating for things that have to do with healthcare, advocating um, for things that have to do, you know, with other scenarios in their lives, whether it be another family, a friend, some other kind of scenario. If you feel like your child is being mistreated or not being given a fair shot, you're going to have that discussion with whoever that person may be, whether that be another parent or a teacher or a coach or a doctor or whomever that may be. We're there to advocate and activate on behalf of our children, no matter what, you know, um, 
I guess, you know, one of the examples that's cannabis, cannabis specific that comes to mind, I can think of two. There's Wendy Turner, who has Colton's crew, and her son Colton is a Crohn's patient. And I believe Colton is now 17 years old, but she has had a long haul advocating for him in the state of Illinois and has even done work, you know, legislative work and advocacy work in Colorado because of her son's condition. And she's a great example of a mom who really went there and not just advocated for her child, but like made it a platform in order to educate other people and help activate other people. There's also the story of Alexis Bortel. And if you're not familiar with her, Alexis Bortel, I believe it was when she was maybe around the age of 10. Um, she and her family were living in Texas and she had a, you know, she had had years and years of nervous system issues, seizures, you know, horrible, you know, I forget the kind of epilepsy she had, but it was really bad. And, um, they tried everything. They tried everything that modern medicine wanted them to do all the way up until the point that a doctor recommended that they give her a lobotomy. And her parents said, no, it's going to make me terrible because her parents said, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to do that to our child. And so they literally packed themselves up and moved themselves to Colorado and got her a medical cannabis um, certification there. And um, they were able to then, you know, treat her with medical cannabis and her seizures have basically stopped since then. And she has become a huge advocate in this area at the young age of, I think she's maybe 13 now or 14, but this is the kind of stuff that we do. You know, thankfully for her family, they had the ways and means to be able to pick up and move and do that. Not everybody is able to do that, you know, and then they have to watch their, their child or sister or mother, whoever it is, their momming, you know, have to suffer at the, at the fate of the law or even worse, you know? So those are just stories, you know, that I think are, are particularly powerful in the, the Canamom space, you know, that I've, I've learned about over the years. And there's so many more. Um, but, you know, my big point, you know, being here, you know, here being once you're a mom, you're an activist, you're already advocating for people. So you can feel that inside of you. Um, and part of my premise and my, my reasoning for wanting to really talk about this today is because I believe, especially for people like myself, I live in Portland, Oregon, where we have a fully legalized adult use cannabis market that most people in the country would say is a mature market. You know, we had legalization here in 2014. And I actually feel that it is a civic duty of mine and feel that other mothers that are in especially legalized states have a civic duty as well to advocate for those mothers that don't have voices, whether it be because they have had some run in with the law, they've had child protective services involved, you know, their partner has had a run in with the law because of cannabis, regardless of whatever it is. Um, you know, those are all things that, that really affect mothers. And um, it's really important to to as a, a person in a legalized state to advocate for those women who can't speak or won't speak up about it. And, uh, you know, thanks to Tokativity for giving this, you know, amazing platform for us all to congregate and network with one another and be able to feel that community, especially for those of you that are, you know, out there kind of watching and not, you know, in a, a space where you can talk freely about your cannabis use or even your cannabis curiosity. Um, it's just really important. Um, so that kind of brings me to my my next point um, about activism, um, because I think when people say, oh, you know, when, when I say to people, oh, you know, you should be civically engaged and you should, you know, you know, be an ad advocate and an activist. I think people often think that that means like, oh, that means I have to start working for a campaign or, oh, that means I need to, you know, be, um, you know, lobbying at the Capitol or I have to work for a nonprofit. That's not true. All of those things are amazingly important. All of them are. But activism, especially grassroots activism, runs the whole spectrum and it all matters because it's this big wheel forward that we're trying to push. It's this big wheel we're trying to push forward, right? We're trying to push the wheel forward for, you know, sound federal legalization. We're trying to push the wheel forward for reducing the, the stigma, you know, eliminating the stigma around cannabis use. We're trying to push the wheel forward, especially like on this event for, you know, cannabis consuming mothers and how like maybe weed is the new wine and you guys shouldn't be so judgy about it. You know, whatever it is, it all requires activism and there's so much work to be done, especially in the area of cannabis use and drug law reform in general, which is intertwined with all the other, you know, social injustices that we need to work on in this country for sure, um, is all intertwined. And I really believe that moms have the, um, 
collective power to be one of the most pivotal voices in this movement in terms of, of changing things. You know, um, I know we got Bianca, High Society Mama, speaking here today about normalizing cannabis use. And, you know, she made a post on her Instagram the other day about once cannabis use is accepted from others, then it will be normalized in the rest of society. And I believe that that is 100% true. So whether we're talking about actual policy change or we're talking about lifting the stigma and normalization, it all applies here. And activism is important, whether you are doing one of those things or doing doing something so much smaller. So sitting down around uh, the kitchen table with your extended family who may be skeptical of cannabis and starting a conversation about cannabis as medicine, that's activism. Um, going to, I don't know, I guess it's COVID now, so we're not like going to gyms and stuff, but like going to do yoga in the park, going for a walk with your friends, um, having a Zoom call with people. It's really about, you know, having your community, but then also like talking with those people that are more skeptical about it and starting that conversation. If you are only talking to one person who is skeptical about cannabis and presenting them with validated research and information about cannabis that they can then own and understand that, you know, what they've been fed for decades is propaganda and conjecture, that's activism, even if it's just one person. So no matter how big or small of what you're doing, what your conversations are, what your actions are, it all matters. And so I hope if nothing else that people today are able to take away, you know, just a couple different things that they feel like they could do. And I'm going to talk about that here as I get closer to close. And I do want to say if people have questions or want to share screens, I'll probably look at um, doing that closer um, towards the end of my talk because I will really want to hear what you guys have to say. And I'm looking forward to the discussion, but I just have a little more content I want to get through first. Um, um, let's see. Yeah. So, it, you know, the next thing, you know, that you can really do, or if you haven't done so already, I think the first two things you can do for yourself to become a confident activist are find some community, which if you're at this event right now, you got it because tokativity is the community for you ladies, because they're amazing. You know, I feel really fortunate to have been working alongside tokativity since they very, very first began. And, um, I've just, it's been incredible watching them grow and be able to, you know, provide this kind of opportunity for so many women to network and become empowered and learn things. So the first thing you can do is this right here, find some kind of community so that you do have some like-minded people. Maybe you already have them, even if you're a prohibition state. You know, I know when I was still living in Missouri, I had my friends who I didn't talk about weed with and I didn't smoke weed around and I had my friends that I did. <laughs> so maybe it's like that for you where you live. And if the, and then, so then you have some community on the ground or you're at too. So that's great that you already have those things. The second most important thing that you can do is educate yourself. And I don't mean you have to go write a research paper. I mean, find like two or three really great articles about what, um, it is that you want to activate on because there's so many things, you know, we can talk about cannabis and social equity. We can talk about cannabis and um, responsible adult consumption and the issues we have with child protective services. We can talk about cannabis being viewed as medicine and being treated as such for our family members. There's so many different things, but whatever your thing is, find a couple of published articles um, that are about those exact things. Maybe it's debunking. One of my favorites to present people with is debunking the history of prohibition. So many people don't know the history of prohibition in the United States. They have just been taught just say no. And, you know, that's basically what they think of it, that it's just evil and it's always been illegal. Well, that's not the case. So if you don't know that, and um, at the end of my talk here, I'll also drop a few links in the chat to um, some articles that are on my site, theweblog.com, um, that are really helpful in this. But really by a quick Google search, you can find it on CBS, CNN, ABC, you know, WebMD. You can find some, you know, what I would call press resources that even a skeptic is going to say, okay, if that news source is reporting on that, then I'm going to actually consider it. Um, so that's really important. So have just, you know, two or three links to like articles that you think, you know, you would be able to present people with, you know, who are skeptical about it. And then, and maybe, you know, once you have your statistics knocked out, you know, there's so many statistics just about number of people incarcerated over nonviolent cannabis crimes, you know, or number of people needing, you know, cannabis access in states that don't allow medical access to it and things like that. There's so many out there. And I'm going to give you guys a few at the end of this talk as well. Um, so that's, you know, definitely an important thing to keep in mind as well. Um, I would like to also recommend some organizations that are really, really important to, um, or that I feel are really important to be watching because like I said, if you guys are all, you know, at this event right now, if you're following Tokativity, Tokativity, you know, has been 
really great in terms of using their platform as a vehicle for activism and as a vehicle for activations for people to actually, you know, create, you know, to actually do calls to to action for you know their followers to be in touch with their legislature legislature or be in touch you know in whatever the call to action is they've been incredible about it so just keep following what Tokativity is doing and I would encourage you to follow the weedblog.com as well both our website our Facebook ironically our Instagram account got, got disabled on 420 and got put back up and then I posted another social equity post not even a weed post and they disabled it again but I'm hoping to get it back up after the appeal process I'm going through side note anyway weed industry problems um, but some of the um, organizations also that I would like for you guys to check out I've already mentioned a few of them there's Mommies and Mary Jane who's going to be hosting a session room right after this session and that's where I'll be hopping to if you want to discuss anything further um, they're incredible. Like I said, fledgling nonprofit doing all things, mommy and Mary Jane. There's a can of mommy nonprofit. Again, like I said, we got Kelly Bruce here. I'm a board member of that. Another really great organization to follow. Um, and then for overall drug policy reform, I would definitely say that the Drug Policy Alliance is a solid handle to follow. They don't just talk about cannabis um, legalization and um, normalization, but they work on drug law reform as a whole and other issues that are intertwined with, with drug law reform, you know, such as prison reform, asset forfeiture, you know, other things like that that are, you know, mostly in the social justice, social equity realm of things as well. Um, so they're really solid if you haven't heard of drug policy. Policy Alliance. And then, um, like I said, I'm on the advisory council for Marijuana Matters, which is an incredible um, nonprofit that was started through grassroots. It's been going for several years now. Um, black founded, black run under the leadership of Khadija Tribble, who's an incredible, incredible activist herself and just inspires me every day in her work. They're called Marijuana Matters. That's another one that I would check out. And then there's Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Roz McCarthy is another um, thought leader, amazing advocate, also a mother um, whose story is also very powerful in terms of coming into the sort of cannabis space because of advocating for both her mother because of breast cancer and her son because of um, Crohn's. So, um, or not Crohn's, sorry, sickle cell was her thing. So really incredible. So Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Marijuana Matters, Drug Policy Alliance, and then um, my two mommy favorites are the Canna Mommy Nonprofit, Mommies and Mary Jane are two organizations. And then please keep following for following Tokativity as well. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanna do is um, talk about in terms of activism. So like, so I'm kind of, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, but we've talked about like, okay, so you find your community, whether it's an online community, and a on the ground community or a little bit of both, you find your community, then you educate yourself, you, you know, find your resources that you want to have, you know, kind of in your like suitcase or your toolkit, I call it, you know, for when you need to present this information to people. So you have those two things and then you're ready to like activate, right? You're ready to activate. So whether that, act, maybe that activation, like I said, is sitting down around the kitchen table with like, you know, your parents and aunt and uncle or something like that. Um, or maybe it is, you know, a walk in the park with a couple of your friends who you've never talked with cannabis about before and you, you know, are ready to do that. Or, you know, maybe it's something much bigger. And what I'm going to encourage all of you do to do is to get to know your legislators because it's so important. If you are communicating your thoughts and feelings about cannabis and where it should be in terms of legalization or normalization with them, that matters just as much as you physically walk walking in to your state capital and lobbying and going to their offices. Every phone call, every email, every other kind of communication, but, you know, especially like, you know, I know this, we don't do snail mail a whole lot, but postal mail, um, all of those things, you know, if you send those three pieces, you know, if you send the same piece of information in an email, a letter written and on a phone message, those are three votes basically for whatever the bill is that you're advocating for or whatever the thought is that you're advocating for. So I'm gonna drop in the chat now. It's going to be different for every one state. So for example, for me, I'm in the state of Oregon. So if I want to find out who my legislators are, I go to the Oregon State homepage and then I, you know, go, they have every state has it different. So you're best off just Googling like Alabama, you know, state homepage or state, you know, Alabama um, state legislature or something like that, Alabama state Congress, whatever your state is. And then a link should pop up. It, it, once you get onto your state's webpage, there should be a little tab, usually somewhere in one of the corners of the screen that says, find my senator, or find my representative. And then you usually just have to type in your, um, 
uh, zip code, sometimes your address, and then it will tell you who your representative is and it will give you their postal address and their email address and their phone number at the Capitol. That's the information you need to get. So copy and paste that information in a document or an email to yourself or something like that so that you have it. Um, what I pasted in the chat here is um, two links to find out who your uh, legislators on are in Washington, D.C., so who represents you um, on the national level. So if you go to those pages, it's the same thing. You'll find the tab and you can find out who your leg legislators are. So now everybody's going to have like one state senator, one state representative, and then one U.S. senator and one U.S. representative depending on where you live. You're going to have those. So that should be four people's information that you have. Now, if you really want to like go deep in it, and I would encourage all of you to do so as long as you're already typing in stuff. If you are a business owner, like an actual brick and mortar business owner, and you don't operate in your home and you're in another area, then you have probably four more. So find, look at the address of your business and type that one in there and see if your legislators are different there. Because if that's the case, then you have the power of advocating as a constituent who's a resident and the power of advocating as a constituent who's a business owner. And I'm telling you that legislators care about this stuff. It matters just as much as you, you know, marching in the streets, going to lobby, setting up a meeting with your, you know, representatives. It matters just as much to have these pieces of information. Okay. So I would encourage everyone to do that. I hope that after this talk, everybody will go home and find out who their legislators are. And then you have that information, like I said, pasted in a document or you know, sent in an email to yourself. You have that information to get in the contacts in your phone, however you want to do it. But then you have that information. And so then your next step is keeping up to date with what is going on with the laws in your area. I'm in Oregon where there's a mature market. We still have a lot of advocacy work to do. Like I said, we're working on a cannabis social equity bill right now because we still don't have free automatic expungement here. You know, so there's always advocacy to do. Now, I understand I'm sitting in a privileged place where I can sit here and smoke a joint in my house and not worry about my kids getting taken away or anything like that. Um, also, um, you know, so so whether you're in a mature market like mine or you're in, you know, a market where you don't even have, you know, medical access yet, you know, um, there is a group there somewhere who is advocating for the same thing probably that you're thinking about. There is a group there advocating, whether it's for legalization, whether it's for, you know, you know, having a lift on child protective services for nonviolent, you know, marijuana offenses or something like that. They're there. You know, you can always start with like a local normal chapter, um, women grow, you know, it, there's in the prohibition states, the options for these kind of organizations are often a lot different and a lot more scarce than they are in states like Oregon or, you know, California, Colorado, these states that have, you know, more mature markets in them. Um, but they exist. And by Googling around and honestly, by continuing to be with Tokativity and using their network to help you, you know, find those kinds of people, that's all, um, you know, really great stuff that you can sort of, you know, you know, sink your fingers into, so to speak, and, and hang on to. Because then eventually, hopefully, what is going to happen in your state is you're going to have um, a vote. You're going to have a vote, whether it's on medical cannabis access or adult use cannabis access, or you're going to have something go through your state's legislature, which is what we're trying to do in Oregon with the Equity Investment Act. Um, so we're lobbying at the state level in the Capitol to try to get a bill passed. That's one way of advocacy. And that's where all those legislators' names will come in handy. So you'll find out like, oh, my local advocacy group, they're supporting House Bill 2560 or whatever it is. That's when you go and take those numbers and emails for your um, legislators and you email them and say, hi, I am your constituent and I support House Bill, I don't even remember what I said, 2650 or something like that, but whatever it is. And then you tell them why. And that matters. It really does. And, and they are bound to um, representing their constituents, you know, and especially if you're a business owner, you operate in some other capacity aside just being from being a resident. Um, so keeping up to date with what, you know, if you really, if you can't find any act, activism groups, what eventually usually happens is there's a press article that comes out in the local press and they'll interview someone from an activism group or they'll interview like a lobbyist or something like that. And that's how you can kind of find those people if they're really hard to find. Because I understand in some states it's a lot harder than others. You know, we're really lucky here in Oregon that we're allowed to freely network um, about this. Um, a next thing that I would um, 
encourage everyone to do who's listening and really anyone who's a parent is to talk to your kids about cannabis. I know we got a lot of discussion happening about this at this event today. I know Miss Kindness was going to talk about it. I know we're going to be talking about it in the Mommies and Mary Jane room that's going to be happening after this. But super, super important that you educate your children, you, you as their parent, it is your responsibility, not the school, not your kids' friends, not your kids' friends' older siblings, not, you know, another parent. You have that conversation with your children. If you're in a prohibition state, obviously that conversation starts with what the law says. The first thing you educate your kids about is the law, right? Then you can educate them um, in terms of like, the those articles that are in your toolkit you know depending on the age of your kids you can probably pres you know my kids are older so i have they have seen that information you know they understand what the science says and what the research says about the cannabis plant and that it doesn't align with the laws in our country they understand that now um so educating your kids and then making sure you know that not only they know the laws and the research about it um but also, you know, that they can have that open dialogue with you and continue to ask you questions about it. Because, um, you know, if you don't talk to them about it, somebody else will. And it's, they are going to be some of our most powerful advocates as they are growing up because they're growing up in a completely different world, at least than I did, you know, so different. I mean, I was definitely just say no era. So just the fact that we can like have open dialogue about cannabis and other substances with our families is um, really just shows how far we've come in that way. But there's still so much work to do. You know, like I said, I'm sitting in a privileged place with the legalized cannabis market in a state that just decriminalized all drugs and has psilocybin research and stuff. So obviously this is different than being like in the South or something like that, you know? Um, but educating your kids is really, really important um, and will help you probably on your journey as a parent with this whole situation as well. Um, let's see. Um, you know, and then it just kind of goes up and up and up from there. I've already given you guys so many things that you can do all the way from like talking with your extended family around the dinner table to um, getting involved with like, you know, the the organizations in your area and, you know, becoming, you know, a voice um, to your legislature legislators, to your senators, to your representatives, so they know who you are. They are going to, you know, listen to you and, you know, probably heed, especially if there's many of you. Um, you know, that's, those are the next big steps. So the next big step obviously is mobilizing other people. Um, during the uh, Measure 91 campaign here in Oregon, I founded a group called Moms for Yes on Measure 91. Um, the group was basically just a Facebook group. We were not a C3 or anything like that. Um, but we grew really quickly and um, proved to be pivotal in the campaign that was running in 2014. It mattered um, fully by grassroots alone. You know, this was just pe women like myself that were joining or, you know, dads too, that were joining a Facebook group saying, I think we should have legalized adult use cannabis in Oregon. And that was it. But once you get you know, that power and numbers thing matters. And especially when you're communicating with your legislators, you know, and then, you know, if you want to take it a step further, you know, you're getting involved with your organization, maybe, you know, there is going to be a campaign in your state for adult use or for medical cannabis, get involved with that campaign. Campaigns need help with everything. They need help with everything from like putting stickers on piece of paper to cutting stuff to phone banking, you know, emailing, um, you know, obviously, you know, canvassing, you know, standing at the polls, all of those things. But like, find what you feel like is manageable for you because I know you all are moms and you're all busy people and you're all like, you know, already trying to like manage a bazillion things in your own life. So find something that works for you. If phone banking is not something that you feel comfortable with or not something that's really your thing, that's fine. I'm sure they would be happy to have you like, you know, put stickers on postcards and send them out, you know, or something like that. Um, if you want to be super involved, you know, you can be a petition gatherer. Anybody, you know, you take a really quick little class on how to do that, and then you can be certified to collect signatures if it's an initiative petition. That's a great way to be involved, and it's very satisfying, I have to say, as an activist, to see how many signatures you can get and know that, like, wow, 500 of those signatures or 100 of those signatures or 50 of those signatures were signatures that I was able to attain in my, I don't want to call it free time, in, my, in the time that I made to be an activist because I care. I care about this plant. I care about being a mom and I care about what this looks like. Because like I said, mothers, you know, women, but mothers specifically, I really believe have, you know, a huge collective power and a huge collective voice in this cannabis movement that we're looking at right now. And it's super important. So um, I want to, let's see. It doesn't look like I have any questions. Um, so if anybody wants to share screen and join me, that would be 
awesome. Um, I wanted to leave you guys with one thing. Um, I know this is being recorded and I'm going to go ahead. Oh, did I put it down here? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and drop another link in the chat. Um, because I know what we're talking about today is being confident activists and how we can be involved um, as parents, as mothers, as you know, cannabis consumers um, in this movement, how we can have a voice together. And we're talking specific to cannabis, but um, I can't help but every Mother's Day think about those moms that are behind bars and think about those moms that um, maybe have a partner behind bars because of a nonviolent crime, whether it be, you know, cannabis related or not. And um, how difficult that must be every year to have to, to feel that, um, you know, I just saw a story on the sentencing projects um, Instagram this morning. That was a story about a woman who are, no, sorry, the Innocence Project. If you're not familiar with them, look them up. But the Innocence Project, they made a post today about a woman who was wrongfully convicted and served jail for a crime, had her child in prison or in jail, um, was only able to hold him for 15 minutes after his birth, five minutes a day after that, and that was it. And she didn't get out until he was 18 months old after they proved that she was innocent of her crime. crime. Um, and it was a picture of her and her son, who's now 18, and they were celebrating Mother's Day in their first um owned home ever. So it was, it was really sweet. God, I'm going to get emotional about that too. Okay. So I wanted to leave you guys with this. Ugh, my eyes <laughs> will not water up enough. Okay. I just want to leave you guys with this. And this is what I dropped the, in the chat. And this is um, one of my, when we're talking about prison policy, specifically the prison policy initiative is incredible. I've come across them a ton in my work as a journalist. They just have facts about everything that has to do with prison reform in our country. So I wanted to leave you with this. This Mother's Day, nearly 150,000 incarcerated mothers will spend the day from, away from their children. Over half, 58% actually, of all women in the U.S. prisons are mothers, as are 80% of women in jails, including many who are incarcerated, incarcerated awaiting that simply because they can't afford bail. So 58%. Most of these women are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. Most are also the primary caretakers of their children, meaning that punishing them with incarceration tears their children away from a vital source of support. And these numbers don't cover the many women who will become mothers while locked up this year. An estimated 58,000 people every year are pregnant when they enter local jails or prisons. So um, hopefully that lights a little fire under you <laughs> and makes you want to advocate if you haven't before and, um, you know, really, you know, empowers you to, um, you know, become an activist no matter how big or how small, because it all matters. Remember the big wheel, we all got to push it to make it go forward. So that takes executive directors of organizations, that takes campaign directors, that takes policymakers, but it also takes moms talking about it with their friends, with their family, you know, with other people that might be skeptical. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, once you're a mom, you're an activist. Once you have, you know, taken over the care of someone or something else, you are an innate activist. So you already have it in you. It's just about letting it grow and like bloom more into seeing what you can do as that con confident activist that I know you all can be. Um, so I think we're about done here. I don't see questions. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate you being here. Um, would love to follow up with any of you, especially if you have questions about anything. Um, I'm probably the most active on Instagram. Hi, what's that? Mommy's Mary Jane. You know, I'm coming into your sesh room next. Um, I'm pretty, I'm most active on Instagram, but I'm on Instagram, Facebook, um, and I'm on Twitter, but I don't really do it. But, um, if you follow the weed blog on Twitter, the weed blog on Facebook and follow my personal Facebook and my Instagram account is where I'm most active. And it's just at Leah Maurer is my handle. Um, and would just, you know, I'm very receptive to questions and, you know, ideas and things like that, because, you know, just like raising a, a kid, y'all, it takes a village, right? <laughs> It's going to take a village, it's going to take more of a village to like, you know, not just legalize this, but like also like normalize it for all of us. Oh, y'all are so sweet. Thank you. Nadia, Shannon, Lauren, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you all being here. And um, 
this, well, we have three minutes, I think, and that's when the session cuts out. But I'm going to be popping over to the Mommies and Mary Jane room. where We're going to be talking more about talking with your kids about cannabis or talking about making your kids cannabis activists. <laughs> Side note, really fun story um, that I'll share here at the end. And my son gets a little embarrassed. I just think he gets embarrassed when I brag on him at all. But my oldest son, who's almost 16, when he was 18, or when he was 18, sorry, whew, all this emotion's coming up. My son, who's almost 16, when he was in eighth grade, um, he had to do a presentation um, for his health and wellness class. And I got to give the teacher props. And I told the teacher so. I was like, you're awesome. And remember, I'm in privileged, legalized Portland, Oregon here, where things like this can happen. But but the teacher gave them like 20 different topics they could pick from. And one of them was why marijuana should be legal in the United States. And he picked it <laughs> and he gave a presentation on it to his whole, um, you know, eighth grade health and wellness class or whatever. And so I always say like once, you know, things chill out from COVID a little bit and we can actually have like live events again and I can do like live speaking engagements again, that I want to bring him along with me and have him like open one of my keynotes by giving his PowerPoint about why marijuana should be legalized in the United States. Because, you know, it, it's, but it's all about education. It's all about breaking that stigma. And I just feel so fortunate to be alongside all you women and be doing it with you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Tokativity, for hosting this stellar, stellar lineup of content at this event. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all in the other sessions throughout the rest of the day. I hope everyone has a wonderful Mother's Day. Um, because rem remember, you know, if you mother something, you're a mother. And that doesn't have to be a human baby. There are many, many other things that you can mother. Um, so thank you all so much. And um, remember, once you're a mother, you're also an activist. You got it in there. Thank you ladies so much.